Hi, guys. Good to be with you. Do me a favor. Let's open up together to James chapter 5. We are now in our last study through the book of James. We have been together almost four months through this book, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, going through, and now we've come to the end, chapter 5. As we've gathered studying through James, uh, what we've discovered is that James is encouraging us to a life of trust in God, that we would demonstrate genuine trust in God by our actions and our attitudes that honor God. And what James brings us to an understanding about today is something that is near and dear to every single person's heart that is gathered in this room, that is in the cafe, whenever, wherever you're listening to this message. Imagine, if you would, with me, a, a woman who is diagnosed with cancer. As she struggles with this diagnosis, she begins to become discouraged. She becomes depressed. Then she loses her job. As her life seems to spiral out of control, she then gets told by her husband that he wants a divorce. As you imagine this situation where she is physically struggling, where she is emotionally struggling, whether she is questioning the goodness of God, God's ability to heal, God's sovereignty, as she wonders why this is happening to her, her spiritual life, is a miss. Her spiritual life is a mess. As you imagine this situation, you think about what is this person's biggest prayer need. We might discover together today that her greatest need is restoration. As you contemplate this idea of restoration, we're hearing about prayer and healing, the connection between prayer and healing. Not simply in the physical realm, not simply in the emotional realm, but also in the spiritual realm, in the whole person. Physical, emotional, spiritual. And James is uniquely qualified to talk to us about this subject. The guy's nickname is Camel Knees. In other words, this guy spends so many hours praying that his knees are calloused, and they call the guy Camel knees. I don't know if he wore shorts too often or what the deal was, but this is his reputation. It's a man who understands about prayer. He understands about the effectiveness of prayer that is fervently or passionately offered by people who are yielded to God, and he is sharing with us the key to restoration. The key to being made whole is through prayer. And he wants us to discover the benefits of prayer. And what I would suggest to you, let me just put it this way. You know, every so often I have a profound thought, but today isn't one of those days, unfortunately for you. Every so often there's something that God reveals that we may not expect him to show us. And when we discover this truth, it is like an epiphany. The light goes on and we recognize something that was so obvious. It should have been right there for us to appropriate and appreciate all along. But we miss it. And then the light goes on and we have another opportunity to grab, to glean, to appropriate to appreciate, to be transformed. So I'm going to ask you to stand with me as we honor the Word of God and the God of the Word. We're in James chapter 5. I'm going to begin reading at verse 13. I'm going to ask you to follow along silently to the end of the chapter with me. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. Is any among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. 
The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man or woman avails much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. And he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again. And the heaven gave rain. And the earth produced its fruit. Brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and covers a multitude of sins. Let's pray. Father, you have gathered us here to meet with you. You have gathered us here that we would worship you, that we would discover who you are and in rightly understanding who you are and who we are and in rightly understanding all that you have done for us and your desire to do to restore us. Lord, that we would glorify your name, that we would call out to you, that we would intensely and intimately enter into your presence. Father, do what only you can do in this place. Transform us to look more like your son, Jesus. For it is in his name that we ask. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Please be seated. So what we're talking about today is prayer and healing. The connection between prayer and healing. And the objective that I think God has in store for us today is that we would pray and be restored, and that we would pray and be restored. So James starts off at verse 13, and he's helping us to understand who needs restoration. Who needs restoration? He says, is anyone among you sick? Now the term there in the Greek in verse 13 that we translate sick, speaks, or suffering, speaks of general affliction. In other words, is anyone there going through hardship? Is anyone just suffering general affliction? And each of us, whether we're here in the sanctuary, whether we're in the cafe, whenever, wherever we're hearing this, would say, yes and amen. I know what affliction is like. I've suffered. I've experienced hardship. Amen. And so James initially gives us a cue to the key to this restoration. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. And then he says, is anyone among you cheerful? In other words, is there anybody out there who is experiencing the joy of the Lord? That despite your difficulty, that God has given you a peace that surpasses understanding. Is there anyone out there who in your circumstances, regardless of whether they're seemingly good or not, is just filled with the joy of the Lord as Nehemiah would describe it in the 8th chapter, as Jesus would describe it in the 15th chapter of John's gospel, that there's just a sense of joy that transcends your circumstances. And if that's you, again, James helps us. He goes, you should be singing hymns, songs. In other words, psalms, you should be praising God. If God has blessed you with joy, regardless of your circumstance, or you're experiencing a season of wonderful blessing, give glory and praise to God. Amen? But then he says, is anyone among you sick? In the verse, the, the word that is translated in verse 14, the Greek term for sickness there, speaks of a lack of strength or being feeble. I want you to see this with me. He, he's talking here about physical illness. Physical illness. And then he says at, at verse 15 that the prayer of faith will save the sick. And now, we don't see this in our English translations generally, but he's now introduced a second Greek word. Here he's speaking about emotional illness. He's talking about being weary, overwhelmed, burdened by life. Is anyone among you sick that is experiencing physical hardship? Is anyone among you sick who's experiencing Emotional burden, hardship. Now, I would say that he's probably covered at least 99% of us in the room. And you might be here and you're thinking like, gosh, I've never been emotionally overwhelmed. And I've never been physically sick. You'll get your turn. <laughs> well, the, this, um, yes, having good health is a gift from God. And it's a temporary condition. 
going through this life, life is overwhelming. And the most that this world can offer apart from God is escape, coping. That we are afraid of tomorrow. We're afraid of circumstances. That our peace is jeopardized. That we're discouraged. That we're depressed. We are angry. We are frustrated. We are short-tempered. We are unkind. We lack mercy. We tend to be judgmental. All of these emotional and physical conditions. Not only is there restoration available in regard to emotional and physical, there is restoration available in the spiritual realm. It says at, at verse 16 that uh, the prayer of faith will save the sick at verse 15, and those who have sinned, verse 16, shall be forgiven. Those who struggle with sin, those who struggle with life-dominating sin, can receive forgiveness, can receive restoration. Who needs restoration? The struggling, the sick, and sinners. The struggling, the sick, and sinners. All of us. There is restoration that is available through intimacy with God. In Isaiah 53 at verse 5, we read of his stripes. By Jesus' stripes, we are healed. Because of the suffering that Jesus endured so that God and man could be reconciled, we can be restored in every realm. Now, as we contemplate this idea, Jesus is the model. In Luke chapter 2 at verse 52, it says that Jesus grew in wisdom, that he grew in stature, that he grew in favor with God and favor with man. Jesus grew in, in terms of wisdom and the intellect. He grew physically. In other words, his body was sound. He grew in favor with God in the spiritual realm, and he grew in favor with man, the social or the emotional realm. In every single imaginal realm, Jesus is balanced and healthy. He is the model for us. Most of us, dare I say, all of us are out of balance. Either our relationship with God is out of balance, our relationship with others is out of balance, we may be taking care of building up our mind and, and learning and growing in wisdom, but we may be neglecting our body, or conversely, we may be taking care of our body and neglecting the other spheres. We need restoration. There isn't a single person here who doesn't need restoration. Now, typically, when we think of this idea of needing to be restored, what comes to mind are perhaps certain type of, of sin, certain types of attitudes, certain types of behavior. And culturally, it's really easy for us to default to things like, for example, drugs. If you struggle with drugs as a way to cope, and unfortunately, undoubtedly, there are people hearing this right now that that's your thing. If you struggle with alcohol in an effort to cope, undoubtedly, there's people in this room, there's people hearing right now that life has been just so overwhelming to us. We have looked for comfort in the wrong place. Sexual sin, thinking this will make us whole, this experience of pleasure, and so whether it is sex outside of marriage as a physical act with another person, something exploitive such as pornography. And you could be hearing this right now and you think like, I don't struggle with any of those issues. And then you start to think about coveting. There's only 10 commandments written with the very finger of God on the tablets of stone that Moses carried down from Sinai. And with a list of only 10, God thought it was important to include coveting. The idea that we are not satisfied with God's provision and we're looking to things to bring us contentment. Selfishness. 
apathy, a critical or judgmental spirit. And you could be sitting here right now and you're just checking this off in your mind like, nope, that's not me, that's not me, that's not me, that's not me. I've arrived. We call that sin pride. <laughs> we tend to think our focus is oftentimes on physical healing. There is no sense of stigma in the church to ask for prayer for physical healing. In other words, if you've got this condition going on, there's no stigma in including your name in that prayer request. But to ask for emotional healing? To say I'm afraid? To say I'm depressed? I'm discouraged, I'm overwhelmed. There's a stigma attached to that in the church, and it shouldn't be. There shouldn't be a stigma at all about that. I see a lot of prayer requests that come in from Anon. Anon is not some Greek philosopher. Somebody didn't want to put their name to an emotional request. I get it. I understand discretion, especially when it's involving others. But I think there's an issue we need to address head on. And whether a need is physical or emotional or spiritual, they're all equal at the foot of the cross. Amen? There should be no shame. There, there should be no stigma. Furthermore, of all of those needs, there's a tendency to think that the physical need might be the most important, this tangible need, even the default of the emotional, without recognizing that our greatest need is spiritual. If we are restored spiritually in our relationship with God, then it impacts our emotional. It impacts also our physical it doesn't mean that every physical ailment is going to be dealt with at this moment in this life. But it does provide, through every survey, every study that's ever been done, spiritual well-being, emotional well-being produces physical well-being. It's a byproduct. Your greatest need is restoration, spiritually, physically, and emotionally. And restoration is available through Jesus for the suffering, for the sick, and for the sinning. So who needs restoration? All of us. Amen? Amen. So what's required for restoration? What, what do we need to experience restoration? First of all, dedication and devotion to God. So... Uh, James is encouraged, verse 13, is anyone suffering, let him pray. At verse 14, is anyone suffering, or is anyone sick, uh, let him call on the name of the Lord. So we're calling for, first of all, verse 14, elders of the church. In calling for elders, we are recognizing God's authority. We're recognizing that God has raised up people to hold office or who represent spiritual maturity, and that we are coming to these people as representatives or asking them to come to us as representatives of God. And all of that is simply a symbol recognizing God's authority. We're acknowledging God's authority. Five times in these three verses, James talks about prayer. As he talks about prayer, Prayer, at its essence, is all about dedication to God. It is all about devotion to God. Through prayer, we declare our devotion to God. We declare our dependence upon God. We are declaring our dedication to God. And so prayer is simply communication with God. It, it doesn't have to be something that has all sorts of flowery Christian language. It can be. But at its essence, it's just you speaking with God because you have understood God's love for you and that you are right with God because of what Jesus has done for you. And you spend time contemplating God, communicating with God, seeking communion, intimacy with God, 
through prayer. Call upon the elders who will then anoint with oil. Now, in the Old Testament, in ancient times, in the early church, oil was used medicinally. We see that in the parable of the Good Samaritan, that healing was brought. But that's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about the healing value of olive oil. Olive oil throughout the scripture, Old Testament and New, is a symbol of the work of the Holy Spirit. So we are recognizing God's authority. We're recognizing the need of the intervention of God the Spirit. And then we are told to pray in the name of the Lord. Now praying in the name of the Lord speaks of Jesus' authority. We're recognizing Jesus' authority. So prayer in the name of the Lord isn't some mantra that we throw on the end of prayer. In other words, oh God, just give me a Rolls Royce in Jesus' name. Uh, this idea of adding in Jesus' name to your overly ridiculous request doesn't mean that God's going to do it. It's saying, in essence, is this the type of prayer that God would say yes to that I have confidence when I ask Jesus to intercede on my behalf that he's coming to his father and saying, Dad, this is kosher. Sign off on this. We pray to the Father through the Son by the Holy Spirit. And we're to pray with a sense of confidence in the Lord. It says in verse 15, the prayer of faith will save the sick. Now, I want to contrast the heretical, the false teaching of the word of faith. The word of faith says that if you just have enough faith, that God has to respond to your prayers, which in effect would make you sovereign. So that is a perverse doctrine because you're not sovereign. God is sovereign. Amen? Second, it's perverse because if you don't get the things that you're asking for, then you're being told the reason is you don't have enough faith. In other words, if you just had enough faith, you'd get out of that wheelchair. If you just had enough faith, then you'd have a million dollars. If you just had enough faith, and so this is a perverse teaching, and that's not what James is talking about. What James is talking about when he says the prayer of faith, he's saying that you have a confident trust in the goodness of God, the sovereignty of God, the ability of God. As the Apostle John would write in 1 John chapter 5, John says, we are comforted knowing that whatever we ask, that if it is consistent with God's will, he hears us. And if he hears us, he's going to do it. It is no different than you with your children. That sometimes you say no to your children because what they're asking for, no matter how passionate they are about it, it's bad for them. And you say no. And you don't feel like, oh, I'm such a horrible parent. If I really loved you, we'd go out for ice cream at midnight on a school night. You just recognize that this isn't the best idea in the world, and you say no. And similarly, when your children are asking for something that is good and is right and that you're able to deliver, you delight to deliver. And so it is with God. And, and so John would encourage us to have this confidence. This is the same idea that James is saying. Look, that when you pray, you, you should understand you're praying to the God of the universe. There's no problem that you have that's too big for him. You should understand that he's good. Anytime that you doubt his goodness, you can look to the cross and know that he gave you his best. He's not holding anything back from you. And his ability. You never have to doubt his ability. Right? It's like, oh, God, I, I know this is a really big one. you got all this stuff going on in the Middle East right now, and there's all these problems that are going on in this part of the world, and I don't want to bother you with this. But understand, for God to heal cancer is no different than him he healing a cold. And both of them are okay by him for you to come and ask. And to ask with confidence. Right? It's like, oh gosh, I, I don't want to bother you with this one. It's just a cold, and I know there's other more pressing matters. If it's on your heart, lay all of your requests at his feet because he cares for you. Or you, you, you don't imagine God in the heaven. He's like, Michael, Gabriel, be quiet. I'm trying to concentrate. They asked me to heal cancer. This is big. Quiet in heaven right now, everybody. This is not a big deal for God. He is God. <laughs> Amen. 
And yet we don't always pray with that kind of confident faith because we're not always devoted and dedicated to God. The reason why I say that is, here's a biblical example. Acts chapter 12, the apostle Peter is imprisoned. He's going to be executed the next day. And you think about that for a moment. I don't know about you, I'm not sleeping too well that night. All right, so here's the early church. They, they understand that, that the, what is called upon them is not to protest. They're not going to send out the, this team of Navy SEALs, Green Berets, and they're going to bust Peter out of prison. The answer is prayer. So they start to pray, and they're asking God to miraculously deliver Peter. Peter, meanwhile, he's totally trusting God. And the reason for this is that Jesus had told Peter earlier in his life, while Jesus was still walking this earth, doing his ministry, that Peter was going to be an old man, and certain things were going to happen to him. And Peter's looking. He doesn't have an ARP card yet. He's like, "Mm, I ain't an old man yet, so I don't know how God's going to do this, but I'm going to bed. Peter is so sound asleep that when God sends forth his angel to deliver him, The angel's trying to wake up, like, yo, Peter, get up, man. We got to get out of here. And Peter sounds asleep, like, yo, bro, I mean it. Wake up. Nothing. Finally, the angel kicks Peter. I love how the Bible records things, you know? Kicks him. Wake up. Peter wakes up. It's like, you ever had that experience where you're not in your bed? You know, you wake up, you're in a jail cell, and there's an angel. It's like, what is going on here, man? Did I have a bad burrito? Um, Right? This whole thing's going on, and... Peter's like, no, the prayers have been answered. I'm here to deliver you. We got to go. And through one cell after another gate after another gate, it opens up miraculously. And now Peter's outside of the prison. The angel is gone. And Peter's thinking like, hmm. So he goes to the house where everybody is gathered to pray. Knocks on the door. Tick, 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 tick. They go, uh, hey, go see who's at the door. Like, did anybody order pizza? Okay, let's go. See, he's at the door, and they send this girl, Rose, and, and the Hebrew, her name is Rhoda. Rhoda comes to the door. She opens up the door. She sees Peter there. She slams the door. <laughs> it's, it's, like, amazing to me. She runs back where everybody's going, guys, it's Peter. He's been released from jail. They're like, shut up, Rose. We're trying to pray for Peter to be released. Stop interrupting us. Now, did you hear me? It's, it's Peter. You're out of your mind, girl. That, he's in prison, Right? Here, God has miraculously intervened, and they don't expect it. Here they are praying for, oh, God, we know you can release Peter from jail, and we're asking you to release, I've done it. He's at the door. Let him in. Right? You know, it, it first service to ask people, have you experienced God's restoration. To to contemplate, just hear me out for a moment. Think about times in your life where you have been overwhelmed emotionally. I've been there. There have been more times in my life than I could count on hands and toes that I was just overwhelmed. I just wanted to give up. Think about times in your life where you struggle with something that you don't want to even share with anybody. You don't want to tell your family about this struggle. You don't want to tell your friends about this struggle. You're sure not going to let somebody who's in the outer circle in on your inner struggle. But you know it's there. And you try to hide it. You try to camouflage it. You try to put on your best face. And every so often, God reveals this to you. Maybe it is just that gentle, still, small voice. Maybe it's like a two by four right between the eyes. And you just cry out in desperation. And it's not the cry that says, God, I just need to get stronger. God, I just need to discipline myself. God, I need to get this under control. God, I need to stop this. It is the humble declaration of someone who's tried, recognized the lack of our own ability.
custodian resource and just said, God, would you help me? And he's changed something. He's changed your heart. He's changed your mind. He's changed the behavior. Let alone the, the countless times that we have struggled in the physical realm and seen God intercede, not because we deserve it, but because he is good. And there are countless times that I have prayed for God to deliver me from physical affliction. And he has said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. In your weakness, my strength is made manifest and I embraced that physical or emotional or even spiritual struggle and recognized that it was God's way to transform me and to restore me. Is there anybody else here who has known these kind of experiences? Just a show of hands. You can put your hands up. There's some of you who are like embarrassed that God's restored you. It's like, uh, <laughs> it's something we, we should rejoice and give him glory. Dedication and devotion to God. Dedication and devotion to one another. Look with me, if you would, at verse 16. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Um, so, Understand this. Jesus' followers are to share struggles with one another. Now, first of all, let, let's get a, a really proper theological understanding about confession and restoration. First of all, there is one mediator between God and man. 1 Timothy 2, 5. That mediator is Jesus. There is no other mediator. You don't need to confess to a priest. You don't need to confess to a Pastor, the one we need to confess to first and foremost is to God. First John chapter 1, verse 9. If we confess our trespasses, he is faithful and just to forgive us of all of our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That is the primary theological truth of the New Testament. We confess to God. Christ is the mediator who restores us so we are made right or reconciled. That is truth. Amen? So why, in light of that truth, does James tell us that we need to confess our struggles to one another and pray for one another that we can be healed? And here's the other side of that coin that James is trying to expose to us to understand that without dedication and devotion to not only God but to one another, we're going to be unhealthy. That if you don't have people in your life who trust you, trust you enough to share with you their stuff, there's something unhealthy. If you don't have people in your life that you can share your stuff with, share your struggles with, it's unhealthy. And here's what I want you to see. Uh, one of the glorious things that I, I, I just love about neighborhood groups is getting together with a small group of people, oftentimes people that you didn't know or that you wouldn't be hanging with except for the fact that they love Jesus and you love Jesus, so you've come together. You might not be in the same stage of life. You may have different interests, but what brought you together was Jesus. And within weeks or months, you are now sharing intimately your struggles. You're confessing struggles. You're praying for one another. And you're discovering God's restoration. You, you see, apart from other people in our life who are providing a God-honoring perspective, we are going to get skewed. That is a nice word for tweaked, sideways. How should we respond when people share with us their struggles? Three ideas. Three ideas. Love them, encourage them, pray for them. When people share struggles with us, what we should do is show them love that although we might not approve of what they're doing, 
We affirm them and we love them. We accept them. We're not here to judge them. We love them, we encourage them, and we pray for them. What they don't need is unsolicited advice, gossip, and condemnation. Healing is restorative Without dedication to God and dedication to one another, we will get out of balance and will miss out on restoration. Dedication and devotion to God, dedication and devotion to one another. And then the third is determination. At verse 16, James encourages us, the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous person avails much. So uh, what kind of prayer is effective? Fervent prayer. Fervent is passionate. Passion has nothing to do with your physical manifestations. It has nothing to do with your voice. Oh, God! Go! Um, it's nothing to do with that. Passion is about the condition of the heart. Your heart is aflame with the things that God is passionate about. You're fervent. There's a boiling there for God. It is persevering prayer. The fervent, effective prayer of a righteous man or a woman, a person who is right with God because of faith in Christ, avails much. It has good results. It is powerful. It continues to pray as long as God puts that burden on your heart. You continue to pray for it. Whether it's your parents, whether it's your children, whether it's your friend, whether it is your own need, whether it is your church, whether it is whatever. It continues to persevere until God says, stop praying. And as long as he puts that burden on your heart, you keep praying. Praying for it because you're determined to see God's will done on this earth as it is in heaven. Now, so often we are praying about God changing our circumstances, changing others. And it might be helpful for us to be praying, God, change my heart. Change my thinking about you and about them and about my own stuff. And to see him do it. Now, this kind of prayer, this fervent, effective prayer, is a result of determination. That we're going to be a people of prayer. God said that his people are to be a house of prayer. Jesus affirmed that his people were to be a house of prayer. It doesn't simply mean that we fill out a prayer request. That is great. It doesn't simply mean that we can gather in small groups to pray or gather corporately to pray. But we have a life that is characterized by communication with God, contemplation with God, intimacy with God, intensity with God. That is the kind of life that God responds to and does amazing things. The fervent, effective prayer of a righteous man or woman avails much. And so before we figure out what these benefits are, what the benefits are, I want to take about three minutes right now for us to just spend praying in small groups. So right now, if you just turn around, grab some folks next to you, and it's comfortable, we're going to just pray for restoration. You can pray for others to be restored. You can pray for any need that you have. But let's do that right now. Find some people next to you, say hi, and let's start praying.
Father, we thank you for prayer. Lord, we recognize that there is a spiritual battle that is taking place in the spiritual realm even now. You've encouraged us to take on the whole armor of God, that we would understand the word of God and that we would use it in this battle. And most of all, Lord, that you've given us prayer as an effective weapon that we could advance your interests, advance your kingdom. And as we are praying, Lord, to be restored individually, corporately, interceding for others, we thank you that you are hearing our prayers right now. Lord, continue to move in our midst, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Let's come back together. Amen. Okay, so we've talked about who needs restoration. We've talked about what's required for restoration. Let's consider the benefits of restoration. So this is something that I think is going to be potentially surprising to many of us. So we read at verse 17 that Elijah was a man with a nature just like ours. And he prayed to God to seal up the heavens, and it did not rain for three years, six months. And then he prayed again, and God brought forth the rain. So first, James is telling us that Elijah, although he was used mightily by God, he had a nature just like us. He was flesh and blood. He's a human being. It wasn't Elijah's power. It always was God's power, and it always will be God's power to every man and woman who is hearing this. Be encouraged. And then James tells us that Elijah prayed for God to stop the rain, and for three and a half years, there was no rain. And then J James just kind of, matter of fact, summarily records, and Elijah prayed again, and God brought forth rain. And we would look at that, and we think like, wow, that is awesome. But we might miss out on what every Hebrew would understand in reading James' letter. James remembers writing to Jewish Christians who were facing opposition from Jewish people who had not received Christ as Messiah, as well as Gentiles who had received Christ and Gentiles, non-Jews, who hadn't yet received Christ. They were in a no-man's land. They were overwhelmed with life. They were suffering physically, suffering financial hardship, suffering persecution. They were struggling spiritually. God, don't you hear me? Don't you care? They were struggling emotionally because of this opposition, and their life was going south, supposedly. But what they understood was something that is helpful to us to understand the backstory. The backstory of what's going on here with Elijah is recorded in 1 Kings chapter 18. You see, God could have put on James' heart to use any of the heroes of prayer. He could have written about Moses, could have written about Joshua, could have written about David, could have written about Daniel, could have written about Nehemiah and others who prayed and God did amazing things, but he doesn't. He uses Elijah. Why? In the time of Elijah's ministry, the Jews had neglected God. And in their neglect of God, in a desire to make something in their lives to be the object of their affection, they started to worship the false god Baal, the Canaanite god of fertility. It is Baal who is responsible for the rain. It is Baal who is responsible for reproduction, for childbirth. It is Baal who is responsible for the harvest. And God, in an effort to give a wake-up call to his people, moves on Elijah's heart that the prophet, the man of God, is now praying, God, seal up the heavens. And for three and a half years, there's no rain. There is drought. There is famine. And Baal can't do anything about it. God's people are crying out to Baal, and nothing is happening. And then as God moves at three and a half years, he instructs Elijah to, in effect, have a showdown, a challenge of the prophets of Baal, 450 of them, at Mount Carmel, where all of Israel is gathered to see this showdown. And Elijah says, if Baal is truly God, then worship him. And if God is God, worship him. 
And this is how we'll discover. We're going to take this altar. We're going to put a sacrifice on top. And the prophets of Baal get to go first. And they'll call upon their God. And if their God consumes this sacrifice with fire, then he is the true God. And there they take the sacrifice. And the prophets of Baal cry out to their God. And nothing happens. And they start to cut themselves and scream and dance and have all of these outward manifestations. And then Elijah says... Perhaps your God is sleeping. That's how it's recorded in our English translations. But in the Hebrew, what Elijah says is, maybe your God's in the restroom. It's just kind of cheeky prophet speak. And then after hours of nothing happening, Elijah says, okay, let's see what Jehovah will do. And he tells them, take this sacrifice and cover it with gallons and gallons and barrels of water. Make it impossible for God to consume this with fire. And then Elijah doesn't cut himself, doesn't scream, doesn't raise his voice. He just says, so all these people will know that you are God and that there is a God in Israel. I'm just asking you to consume this sacrifice by fire from heaven. And God brings down fire from heaven and it is consumed. And what happens is the people realize that God was and is, and always will be, the only God. And they return to him. They confess. They repent. They change their thinking about God. They change their thinking about their sin. And they return to God. The first benefit of restoration is God's people return to him. God's people return to him. Whether you're receiving Christ for the first time and you have been wandering through this life, and now you receive Christ and you return to him or you've received Christ and then wandered because the allure of this world became more attractive. God invites you to come back to him. The second is that God blesses his people. God's people return to him. God blesses his people. After the people return, now Elijah prays seven times for God to bring forth rain. After the seventh prayer, God responds and rain comes. The people's drought has ended. The famine ends. The harvest is brought in. And see this with me. You have people who were hungry. You have people who were longing. And God met their need for their hunger and their longing. Whenever we wander, we are going to get hungry and we are going to long, whether it's in the physical, the emotional, or the spiritual. And when we return, God blesses so we no longer are wandering. We are filled. Our hunger is satisfied. Our longing is resolved. Third, God is revealed as the end. Not a means to an end. As you think about a woman who is diagnosed with cancer, who loses this struggle, and she enters into discouragement, depression. She loses her job. Her marriage goes south and ends. And you think about what's her greatest prayer need? Her greatest prayer need is God. Her greatest prayer need is God. It is not her job. It is not her spouse. It is not her physical condition. All those things are important, including her emotional condition. But God is her biggest need. God is your biggest need. Oftentimes we approach God as a means to an end. God, take away this thing that I perceive as bad. God, give me this thing that I perceive as good. We approach God like a genie in a bottle. Rather than recognizing that he is the end, not simply a means to an end. This is what Israel discovered. This is what God's people always discover. The greatest aspect of restoration is realizing our need for God and his faithfulness. And until we discover our need for God and his faithfulness, we wander hungry, longing, needing to be restored emotionally, physically, spiritually. If you're struggling right now physically, 
and God chooses to heal, praise God. If he chooses not to heal in this life so that you recognize your dependence on him, his faithfulness, his power displayed in your weakness, and then for eternity you are completely restored in a body that is perfect for eternity. Is that a bad deal? So let us pray. Father, we recognize that we need to be restored. We need to be restored in the emotional realm, in the physical realm, in the spiritual realm. Father, I pray if there's anyone here today who has not received you as Lord and Savior, they will recognize, Lord, the need for restoration, that you want to forgive sinners, you want to save sinners, and that's why you came, Jesus, and voluntarily gave your life so that we could be healed, we could be restored. And Lord, when we forget our need for you, when we struggle and we long and we hunger, remind us, Lord, that you are the end, not simply a means to an end. Let us, Lord, press in and discover more of you. We thank you. We praise you. We give you all honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>